Well, hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Bornholt, and I'm so glad you're tuning in today. I'm also excited to catch up with my guest, Mike Simmons, since it's been a while since we've done a podcast. In fact, it's been a long while. We talked about that a little bit earlier before the show. Mike is a real estate investor, a podcaster, and a speaker who shared the stage with Gary Vaynerchuk in 2018. That's a very big deal. He is the host of a popular podcast called Just Start Real Estate and a partner in Seven Figure Flipping, which is one of the nation's largest real estate mastermind groups. Mike recently wrote a book titled Level Jumping, How I Grew My Business to Over One Million in Profit in 12 Months. And this book tells the story of his success as a real estate investor. And that's what I want to dive in today because we've both been doing this for a very long time. And I want to talk about what it takes to really ramp up your business, no matter where you are today and what your vision is, because your vision for you will be likely be very different than mine or Mike's. So there's not really any wrong or right answer here, which is the beauty of real estate investing. So welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you. I appreciate you having me back. It has been a while. It's been too long. It has been too long. We won't make that mistake again. That's right. That's so right. Um, when I uh, found out that you're uh, about your new book, uh, I, I like to kind of do a little you know, interview stalking. So I went and <laughs> checked out the book and I love the line that you have in there where it says starting a company is easy. Anybody can do that. But growing a company that is profitable and building a team that cares about the success or failure of your company is not so easy. Boy, that is just huge. And I want to talk about all of that. But before that, for anybody that might not know how you got started, tell everyone a little bit about your background. You weren't always the superstar, were you? That book writer, <laughs> stage chair. We all, we all had humble beginnings, didn't we? That's right. And mine could not have been much more humble. Uh, I, uh, Midwest, a Michigan guy, born and raised, uh, raised by uh, my father was a Marine, um, then went to work in the automotive industry, uh, very blue collar, very disciplinary uh, type in some environment and no entrepreneurs. We're all uh, union kind of like go, you know, work as many hours as they'll let you work get all the overtime you can work for 30 years or 40 years and retire. That's kind of what I was, you know, was told was the plan and that was the dream. And I, I believed it because I was a kid and you just, what your parents tell you is you typically believe in, and, they, and there's nothing wrong with that, FYI, it's fine. But some of us have this pull inside of us that pulls us in a different direction and it, sometimes it takes longer than others. And uh, for me, I worked in the union jobs, I worked for UPS, I worked for the automotive industry. I worked my way up into those industries into the automotive and like a mid-level management kind of a position made pretty good money, had a good job. It was as stable as a, as a nine to five job can be, but I was just knew I was drawn somewhere else. And, and honestly, although I had achieved some success in the automotive industry, um, and, and by the way, I went back to college as an adult with kids and a house and a full-time job. So like I bought into that everything, right? And it's for some people that's absolutely dead on what they, what they should be doing. Um, but I got to a point where I was not really happy. I just didn't like what I was doing every day. And I felt like, I, I told somebody this for the first time recently. I've, I've known this my whole life and I, I kind of remember this feeling, but I've never told anybody um, until recently. There, even as early as in my early 20s, when I was just getting started in my life and my career, when I went into work, I had this weird nagging feeling that I was wasting time. Like I wasn't where I was supposed to be, like I was misplaced. And it's a weird feeling and you don't, I didn't really think a lot of it back then. And by the way, it, it took me years after that to actually do something, but I just, I didn't know what it was. It was just something in my body when I went into work said, you're not even supposed to be here. Like the, you're, you're, you are putting off what you should be doing. So anyway, so long story short, I got to a point in my life where I had gone back to college. I had a good job. I had good income, but I wasn't happy with my life when I woke up in the morning, I wasn't excited at all to go to work. Matter of fact, I dreaded it. I dread, I couldn't even enjoy a Sunday because I knew the next day I had to go to work. So it would even ruin my Sundays. And I started looking for ways that I could escape that rat race. And the only thing I could think of was investing. And at the time it was like stocks and the stock market and day trading and things like that. What I thought was going to be the goal. 
And I started researching that stuff and I just, long story short, I absolutely hated it. I hated stocks. I hated reading about it. I hated learning about it. I just didn't like it. So I, I would always gravitate towards something else on the internet, like sports or something. And eventually though, when you, when you Google investing and types of investing and how do I make money investing, eventually you'll, you will stumble on real estate. Even back when I started this, which was this whole like uh, journey toward real estate started back in 2003. And I found real estate and I just fell in love with the, the success stories and all the different websites. And I started buying books and going to seminars and RIAs. And honestly, I did that for like five or six years before I actually made my first offer and got my first property. So what happened in those five years? A lot of spinning my wheels, a lot of paralysis analysis, a lot of fear-based thinking. Um, so, you know, I know what that feels like. I know what it's like to want something, but not do anything about it. And it's, it, it hurts worse than not wanting something. Like when you know you want something, but you're too afraid to do it. So I went through all of that and then eventually made an offer, got, got a house under contract, did my first deal, made a decent, I mean, for me, I, it was like a bazillion dollars, but I made $15,000 on my first deal and I was off to the races. That was, that was, I knew then what I needed to do and I knew where I wanted to be. And I, I ended up still working my nine to five for a few more years because uh, two things. I'm, I have kids. I have a house. I have a mortgage. I have a wife who's <laughs> conservative. And, you know, it just wasn't going to be a popular thing for me to leave at that point. But I worked there for another three or four years. And then I went out on my own and haven't looked back. Mm -hmm. Boy, that is such a common story. You just feel, you know, now my dad did have a contracting business. So he was an entrepreneur. But the thing I remembered growing up was business is hard. Yeah. In the winter, you, you know, we had a conversation uh, earlier and, and I remember that his concern was always keeping his men. So as a child, I have a memory of him saying to me, I don't want to worry your mother, but you should know that. And then I was probably 12 or 13, but I was the oldest mature kid, kid that wasn't going to tear the house down. Yeah. So, uh, but he said, I, al I always borrow money in the winter for the payroll because I need to keep my men and yeah. she always worries about it. So I grew up with this belief that business is hard. Money is, is hard to come by. It's, you know, is it's tough to make money. So it, it was been a struggle for me. So I, I always had the same feeling you did. Like I didn't belong in that job. And, and let's face it. Those of us that are entrepreneurs kind of like to run the show. Yeah. So, um, not being in charge was a hard thing, but what I found was even when I was a, you know, a manager of a, of, of, of a medical practice, it wasn't really enough. It wasn't my business. So mm -hmm. there is a, I don't know how to describe it. There is a feeling that you are not in the right place. Yeah. And there comes a day when you take the leap and you, you just say, I have to give this a shot. I have to try something else because I'm miserable. Like you said, you don't enjoy the weekend because you know, Monday's coming. Yep. Absolutely. And you're right. Being in charge. Cause I had a, you know, a little sliver of, of uh, authority where I, where I worked last and it just isn't the same because ultimately you don't, you don't really make the, the impactful decisions. And then sometimes you have to watch decisions be made that you just know are not right. Yeah. And, and it was frustrating. I wasn't popular. Um, because I was, it was very common for me to second guess my, my manager and say, I, I, we've done that. We've, we've done this already. You weren't here, but we did this in this department. It didn't work. It's not going to work. And here's why. And, and it was, I was being, I was being negative, right? It's like, I'm not being negative. I, lessons learned guy. I, I know what I'm talking about. So yeah, we're tough to employ because we want to be in charge and we know what we want. So <laughs> yeah, just call us spade to spade. We like to be in charge. That's really, exactly. that's really it. Exactly. So tell me about, um, which, uh, so you started out as a rehabber, correct? Yes, I did like rehabbing this? for about six years. Okay, so let's talk about that. So did you did you like rehabbing? I did at first. Um, it was all new, and and you know we were really caught up in the HGTV, you know, flipping shows, yeah. and it was kind of the rage. This was back in two thousand and eight, two thousand nine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I did like it, and it, honestly, my job, my nine to five job, I I had to manage timelines and budgets, so it seemed like a perfect fit. And so I, I did a good job. I, I learned, I learned the industry. I learned what it costs to rehab a house. So I always tell people as far as flipping goes, if you want to be a house flipper, I think the most successful path for a house flipper is the person who can't do the work 
I, I can't build or fix anything, mm -hmm. but I know exactly what it should cost and I know exactly how long I should take. Those are the yeah. two skills you need as a house flipper. The more you know how to do the work, the more tempted you are to do it. And now you're not out raising money. You're not out finding houses. You're swinging hammers or painting, which is nothing wrong with it. It's just not what you should be doing as the business owner. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, I, I did that for six years. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm talking over you. I did that for six years, um, got good at it, um, had a little bit of success in that arena, but, you know, you have sometimes you have to change with, with what the situation is and, the, and where the market is and where your business is. And so I did that for six years and, and then I ended up switching over to wholesaling. The wholesaling. So what, so what made you, was it the risk involved with the, with the, uh, the rehabbing or did, uh, did you, what changed for you that made you go over to wholesaling? So for me, I, I was doing pretty well. Uh, but some of the, one of the mistakes or a couple of the mistakes that I made two of a major, and that's what caused me to have, to have that switch is I had one crew, a construction crew that I relied on. I didn't have a backup crew. I didn't have any other options. I had one general contractor who had his subcontractors that I had no relationship with. And I was doing a job. He was doing a job for me. He had done probably 10 jobs, at least 10 to 15 jobs prior to that. And we had just worked well together like clockwork. He did his work. He was showed up. He, he was honest. I paid him on time. I never hassled him. Like it was really well oiled machine. And then we got to this last job and he started um, upcharging me for things. He started adding things on. He started showing me receipts for a thousand dollars of things that he had to go get that I didn't know about. And it just got really weird. And he was really late. He wasn't showing up for the job. So he, he probably had something going on in his life, but he was sort of taking it out on me and my job. And so I realized, uh, three quarters of the way through the job, like I'm going to have to find another contractor because this guy, I'm not letting him on the next job site. He's obviously spiraling a little bit and I, I just, I can't use him on the next job. Well, on that exact same job, Second mistake I made back then was I relied on a realtor to find deals for me and to give me the ARVs, let me know what it would sell for. And I totally trusted and relied on, didn't double check anything. So on this particular job where the contractor kind of went south on me, uh, the realtor just missed the comps, like just missed them by a mile. It wasn't worth nearly what he thought it would be worth. So once it was done, not only did I overpay for the rehab, I didn't end up selling it for nearly what I was supposed to, and it, which is fine. Mistakes happen, but the contractor had a very cavalier attitude about it. Kind of like, oops, well, what do you want from me? You know, and it's like, what do I want from you? This is your whole <laughs> existence in my, on my team is for this. And so I was like, okay, well, this is obviously isn't going to work. So I, I needed to find a new crew from scratch and I needed to find a way to uh, value, you know, evaluate the properties from a, a ARV standpoint and to find deals. And I had relied on these two people for really the health of my business, which is a mistake. I know that now, but in the meantime, I still had leads coming in because that was on me to get leads or yeah. partially on me. My realtor helped me, but I was getting leads at this time through direct mail as well. So some were still coming in from my efforts and I didn't have a crew and I didn't have a realtor and I was sort of like, what do I do? So I got these leads in. Well, recently uh, around that time I had done, gone to a meetup and I had spent some time with some local you know, uh, house flippers like myself, friends of mine actually, that I had cultivated these friendships and they were complaining. Everyone had the same, same complaint. I can't find any deals. Like there are no deals out there. I'm, I'm literally, my company's dying because I can't find enough deals. So I had this deal come through and it was great. I went and got the contract because I'm just proactive and kind of, I go for it that way. I don't really think about, it. I'll, I'll sign the deal and I'll figure it out, right? So I was like, well, I can go out and try to find a crew and a realtor. I can kind of build my team fast or I know this guy needs work. Like he needs jobs. He needs deals. So I called him up and I was like, hey, man, I got this house under contract. And I just told him what I wanted for it. I didn't tell him what I got it for. I just said, this is what you would have to pay if you want it. And he goes, give me 10 minutes. Call me back in 10 minutes. So I'll take it. I was like, whoa whoa, was that easy and fun? And are you kidding me? That's how this can mm -hmm. work. So I, I wholesaled to him, closed in two weeks. It was just so easy. And, and by the way, in Michigan, you know, the average uh, flip profit is in the $20,000 range, somewhere in there. That's a base hit. You know, it's nothing to write home about, but it's pretty solid. Uh, I made 15000 on that deal and I didn't do anything really other than find it, which is something by the way. But uh, so the next one that came across, I just called the exact same guy. I didn't have a buyer's list. I didn't know anything about a buyer's list. I just called him and said, hey, I got another one. It was very similar to the first one. I gave him the, I bought it for the same thing. I gave him the exact same price. And without even even looking it up, he said, I'll take it because he knew the area. Yeah. And that was another 15000 
And I was like, wow, a wholesaler was born that day. Literally, you could have, you could have literally watched me hatch out of an egg. That was me. I was a wholesaler. <laughs> and that's all I wanted to do from that point forward. And I just finished up my other projects and I stopped flipping from that mm -hmm. point forward. That's, a, that's very similar to my story. It was just so much easier with really little to no risk. As long as you bought the house right, you could sell it in, in a hot five minutes. And I tell people all the time, you don't need two dozen people on your buyers list. You know, same five, six, seven people bought all my deals all those years. Yep. And I knew where they were going to buy. Now, the only exception would be that I had a, a buyer for... Um, some period of time that bought in what I call the really low end areas that where the cash cows are, those deals I used to throw away. And when he was around, I would just say, go look at it. Tell me this is what I want. You know, it yeah. was just like, I didn't even drive to look at them, but I, I threw away a lot of deals, but it was, there was just, it was just easier. It mm -hmm. was just easier, but I would caution people to say, it's easier when you're an experienced investor. It's that's yeah. the key. I think I'm, yeah. I'm not, I don't necessarily think it's easy for a brand new investor that's never done a deal because they don't know, they don't know how to do ARV. They don't have a buyer's list. They don't have relationships yep. and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. I feel really lucky. I didn't realize at the time, but having six years of flipping experience made me a much better wholesaler. Yeah. And I agree with you. I think that the, the real uh, misinformation or the misconception that people have is when you're new in real estate, start off by wholesaling so you can get some quick cash to build money or, or to build up money so that you can eventually start flipping. And I, that can work, but I don't know that that is the easiest path. That's not what I would do if I was starting over with no knowledge or if I was trying to, um, matter of fact, I, I could tell you, I, my daughter came to me who at the time was 24, uh, a year, about a year and a half ago, she came to me and said, I want to start investing in real estate. What do you suggest I do? How do I get started? And what do you do? Well, I've been wholesaling houses now uh, almost exclusively for about five, six years. And I said, I would start by flipping if I were you, because what people don't realize sometimes with wholesaling, yes, you don't need the money to buy the house usually, right? You can get by right. without having the money for the house, but you have to generate leads. And sometimes you do that, it costs money. You have to buy lists and yeah. uh, mail out postcards or letters or whatever the case may be. There is money involved. Um, with flipping, you can. there are people who are handing, you know, like b serving up deals on a silver platter and those are yeah. wholesalers, right? That's what we do. Mm -hmm. So anyways, long story short, she said she wanted us to do it. And I said, this is what I think you start by flipping, gave her some basic groundwork, told her how to, how to do ARV, said, get on every wholesaler's list and make offers. I don't care if your offer is way lower than what they're asking. You run your numbers and you make your offer that you, mm -hmm. that you want the house for. And within a month, she had three deals. Wow. Right? So, and she didn't put any of her own money out there. She used wholesalers to find them mm -hmm. and she used hard money to buy them, yep. you know? So it's like, that's how you can get started and it doesn't cost you a lot and it just takes a little bit of time and energy. But, um, I, I think wholesaling, you know, I, I had, I'll tell you another quick story, but I, um, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to say a relative. I won't say who it is <laughs> who wanted to start flipping houses. He had not done it. He, this was like a year ago. So I've been in the industry for a long time. And he started telling me why wholesalers don't have any risk mm. or any money in the game and how house flippers take all the risk. And so wholesalers really don't deserve to make much money. And I was ah, like, "What? first of all, thanks for your vast knowledge, Mr. <laughs> Haven't done this ever. Um, but I said, you know how much money I, I spent last month in marketing costs? Mm. By the way, there's no, there's no asset attached to a marketing cost. You right. send it out into the ether. And based off of experience and history and what you know, it should come back and you should make money. But theoretically, you mm -hmm. can spend all the money you want on marketing and nothing could come of it, right? Exactly. And I've, had, I've had those months. And he's like, well, and I said, but you know, you buy a house as a flipper and the minute you buy it, it's worth more than what you paid. And as you rehab it, it's consistently keeping ahead of what you've pay, put into it is what it's worth, right? So yeah, there's risk when you're flipping, but honestly, I would say it might be less risky, especially at scale. Like wholesalers mm -hmm. at scale, are spending tens of thousands of dollars on marketing and, and all that stuff. And so anyways, that was a fun conversation. I'd, uh... Well, yeah. And I love those stories because people, they really, they really believe that. Mm. And it's, they, they don't see the value in the fact that you do spend money on direct mail. You go to networking events and you, you do work, you work your contacts yeah. and you do 
all the other things that you do marketing wise. Yep. And this builds up, maybe you'll network with somebody for two years and then one day they'll call you. So there's work and yep. there's actual money behind the marketing end of this. And it's, it's greatly undervalued with some people, I will say. Yeah, totally. And as a marketing person yourself, Sharon, I know you're a very, very good marketer. As a, as a house flipper, once I started wholesaling, I knew how house flippers thought. I know what my client wants and I know how mm -hmm. to deliver that to them in a way that makes sense for them and makes it easy for them to make decisions. Mm -hmm. When you're starting off new and you're a wholesaler, you don't know how to flip a house. You don't, you don't know what your client is even wants or what, how their brain works. So yeah. it just made sense for me. Yeah. And I think wholesaling is a hard strategy personally to start out with. I do too. So now you started out like so many of us uh, like to say a one man band. How long did you stay that way? <laughs> a long time. Mm -hmm. I had some limiting beliefs. I was a one man. I think I didn't start hiring people until the end of 2015. Mm -hmm. So I started in, in 2008. So, so seven years. Uh, yeah. And that's pretty common, if not longer. I know people that have been investing forever and they still do everything themselves. Well, the circular logic that I was working with was I'm not big enough to hire. I don't have mm -hmm. enough business to hire, to hire, but I couldn't get big enough until I started hiring. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't hit that, that uh, critical mass until I started hiring. So mm -hmm. it's like this circular logic can't hire, not big enough. Won't be big enough unless I hire, you know, mm -hmm. so that's kind of what the, the weird circular logic I was in. So, so building a team is something that people struggle with. Um, I, I don't know a single person that hasn't just wanted to bang their head against the wall when they started doing this. Yep. So I know that one thing that I, that I respect about you and, and some of the, what I call the, the more enlightened um, flippers and wholesalers today is that they think about culture. They're not just hiring for a job, which rarely um, means that the person is invested in your business in any, in any way. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how you hire people that will be, how you get successful hires, you know, and what do people, what are they doing wrong in this process? Yeah, well, let's. I'm going to take one quick step backward and explain the the overall problem with entrepreneurs hiring in general. It's that it's the same thing I saw when I was in the automotive industry. They would take the most talented engineer in the engineering department and they would promote him to manager or her to manager. Mm -hmm. And then you have the most talented engineer no longer doing engineering. They're managing engineers, but they're not managers. They're yeah. good technicians. They're not good managers. So we do this as entrepreneurs. We start a business. We're a one man band or a one person band. We're, we get good at finding deals. We get good at negotiating. We get good at flipping or whatever you're, however you're doing it. And we get good at all these things. But then we start hiring that. We start hiring people to do those things. Now we have to teach and manage people how to do it. And not everyone is a great teacher and a manager. Right. So that's why a lot of times the wheel starts falling off and they think, oh, I hired the wrong people. These people are bad. The people may not be bad. You might be bad. You know, you might be a bad manager and, and we don't, and, and so we default back to what we know, which is I'm just going to do it myself. And then we yeah. get in this vicious cycle of not yeah. being able to build a team. Um, for me, building a team, I, I'll tell you what, I, I made a lot of mistakes in, in my book. Um, the subtitle of it is how I grew my business to over 1 million profit in 12 months. That is literally like my second business because my first business, I was a house flipper. This is my wholesaling business that I built up like that. Um, and I made a lot of mistakes. And as I was growing the business through that first 12 months of being a wholesaler, I, I burned through a lot of people, to be perfectly honest. I brought them in. I expected things from them that wasn't probably realistic or fair. I expected them to be like me, which mm -hmm. not that I'm remarkable, but it's my business. So yeah. I will literally do anything I have to do to yeah. make sure I get it done. And, and not everybody's like that, right? Especially not when you're bringing them in and sort of like, mm -hmm. you're really just lighting them on fire and watching them burn out. And I was really burning through people. So it took me a while to realize what culture meant and what it meant to like, what I call in the book, you, you create this relationship bank, okay? And you can't just take withdrawals from a bank. If you don't make deposits, you will be overdrawn. And I think relationships with your employees are like this too. In other words, I hire them day one, I start screaming at them and telling them what they've done wrong. They're gone, they're out of there, right? But they work there for 10 years, we have a great relationship, I invite them over, they know my family, I know their family, I care about them, they know I care about them, I've done nice things. They, and then all of a sudden you have a bad day and you kind of have to like come down at them 
they don't quit because they have all this history. Yeah. They know you're not a bad person. It's just, hey, it's a bad day. Maybe he just lost his temper a little bit. So because I've made enough deposits, I'm able to make that withdrawal if, if that's what it comes to. So I think when people bring folks into their company, they just like give them the job and they expect the money will be enough. I'm paying them. They should just want to do anything for me. And everybody's not motivated by money the way some people are, right? Maybe not even like the, the millennials and the, and the younger generation. They value autonomy. They value um, some of the other small perks that, they, that you might get. And the money is great. It's necessary. But giving someone a raise doesn't necessarily mean they're going to work harder for you, right? right. And that money just becomes, you know, it's like, if you're making a thousand dollars a week and I give you two hundred dollar raise, after six months, that two hundred dollar two hundred dollars is expected. You know, it doesn't feel like anything special anymore. So there's a lot of things that you can do, and and I, I became a big fan of pro, of uh, personality tests like mm -hmm. the Colby, the DISC. There's something else mm -hmm. called the Culture Index. I really, really, really utilize those things, and I know they're not perfect but they help paint a picture, an overall picture of the person that I'm bringing in. And if the tests tell me that they're not detail oriented and I'm bringing them in to like deal with title issues and things, and I know that the test said th this person is not great mm -hmm. with details, I can't expect them to do that job very effectively. So I do rely on those tests to give me a baseline of who I'm dealing with, knowing that everyone's life experience is sort of can modify their profile a little bit, but I, I do like personality profiles. I think they, they make a difference in the hiring process. Well, I, I, I've heard that a lot from people lately. I think, uh, I think again, it's a, it's a maturing of the uh, real estate investor world. I really, I really do think that's it. But yeah. I love what you said about the relationship bank. If you don't make deposits, you can't make withdrawals. But that's a great way to look at it because it's hard to get somebody as invested in your business, your profitability, in um, taking care of your customers as you are. I faced that in yeah. my last business. And a challenge I had in the home inspection business was I could get a, somebody that was great technically. They could be so good technically, but they couldn't have an intelligent conversation yeah. with and not make a realtor furious. Yeah. Or I could get somebody who was great with the people and maybe their technical skills weren't so great. But in that business, you really had to have both. And if you were yeah. lucky enough to find both, that was called your future competitor. <laughs> yeah, to totally. And, and you know, those relationship deposits, by the way, it works for personal life too, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. um, those relationship deposits, and I say deposit, we're using that just as a metaphor. Like we had an employee at one point, um, she had a, a, her father needed therapy, physical therapy, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was in the afternoon. So she literally needed two hours off from two to four every day. Like what Mm -hmm. What company can accommodate such a weird schedule? Yeah. But we did. And that alone, like the money was great, but she didn't want to raise. She wasn't like, she was a hard worker. The fact that we gave her that leeway meant the world to her. Mm -hmm. It was, it was everything. She would have done anything for us because we just made, made some concessions that sort of fit what her life required. And those are the kind of things that can go a long way. So yeah, flexibility and autonomy and, if your child is sick and you can work from home, that, that's huge for somebody that they yep. can't get if they're working for Ford Motor Company or wherever. Because yep. they, they're not going to, in most cases, allow that flexibility. Yep. So one thing that intrigued me about your book and your story in general, um, going from barely profitable side hustle to a business that generated over a million dollars in profit in 12 months, that is huge by anybody's standards but you referred to that as level jumping. And I love that term. So I want to talk about that. First of all, what the heck is it? Mm -hmm. And I, so that people understand what exactly are you talking about? Yeah, it's a great question. And I struggled a little bit with the title because I like, I like that title too, um, but I know that it doesn't necessarily intuitively mean anything to some people, or to well, most people, it doesn't mean anything. So what I mean by that is, in the in the way that I was able to do that is, it's in the book, but what what it's not is a list of software and tools that I use to grow my business because mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer that software and tools come and go and they're great, but that is not how you grow a business. You can't grow a business with just tools, right? right? So I know that it took hiring, it took building a culture and all these things, but how did I do it? So for me, 
and it's part of the, in the book, I, I cover this in later chapters, it's masterminds and mentors. Mm -hmm. My life changed like you can see the hockey stick growth happened when I joined a mastermind that was full of good people and run by someone who cared and had a lot of members in it that had that were farther down the road than me. They were kind of where I wanted to be and I was where they were four years earlier, three or four years earlier. Mm -hmm. And once I got around people who thought like me, people who were rowing in the same direction that I was rowing, mm -hmm. and then maybe most importantly, people who were just farther down the road who could kind of point out the potholes that they fell in along the way. And if I could avoid the mistakes that they made, and I can learn from their hindsight, right? Can you imagine if we could go through our whole life with hindsight, now, the yeah. things that we could have avoided, right? Really. <laughs> And I think masterminds and mentors give you hindsight on where you're going, which is so powerful. So I took a guy, Andy McFarlane, good friend of mine. And I just, at the time it was a small mastermind and he was by far the most successful guy. And I just said, what did you do? Like you, I'm where you were three years ago. I want to be where you are. Can you just tell me what you did right and wrong? And he spent time with me and told me, and I said, well, if it took you three years to figure this out organically and just no guidance, just you figuring it out. Why can't I do it sooner if I know what you mm -hmm. did and I know what you did wrong? And he's like, yeah, for sure. So I did. That's exactly what we did. And, and then the other component is when you're, when you're building a company, uh, you have to have a little bit of like, just go get it. Like just yeah. start, just do it, have a little bit of risk tolerance. And so by, by uh, surrounding myself with people like Andy and some other folks that were in the mastermind, I felt like I didn't just go to the next level. I was able to jump levels. I was yeah. able to to jump past the next level and go to the one after that because yeah. I had someone showing me how to do it. So level jumping, that's how I came up with the name. Well, I actually love the name. And I, th I, th I don't think it's going to be hard for people to understand, but I just wanted to be sure. So, okay. So if you're, if you're starting here and you want to get here, there's a lot of things have to happen in the middle. Some of those would be systems. Some of those would yeah. be people. So if I'm here today, I mean, I, I'm 100% on board with masterminds and mentors. You, you can do it, this, I call it the slow, hard way, or you can invest in yourself. And it's, it's hard to write those checks sometimes. I yep. mean, yep. We've, all, we've all done it. And um, it's, it's not easy to make that commitment because I'm going to tell you, those level programs do not come cheap. Nope. So, but you've got to think about, what, what's my vision for my business? And if you're doing five deals today and you want to be doing 30, that that's a six X factor. Yep. You don't necessarily have to be thinking of 200, but you can jump levels. And then maybe if you get to 20 or 30, then maybe it's a hundred for you. Maybe it's yep. not, doesn't matter, but it's by far the faster way to get wherever it is. That is the right number for your, for your business. Yep. So do you start with systems? Do you, is there a perfect uh, team member you need next? Is there like a, like, like an integrator or someone that you need? Who, who's the first person or two? If someone wants to know, I don't know where to start. What, what's your answer to that? Because I know that I get a lot of different answers. Yeah, that's a great question. So for me, it was, it was about systems early on. Mm -hmm. um, we talked briefly before we went live here. I, I used to reinvent the wheel every time I had a new deal. I, I would handle it differently. I, I had no uh, yeah. process at all. And the, and the thing you have to realize is if you're listening to this and you're saying, well, I don't have a process. You do have a process. You just haven't documented it. And it might be really bad, but you have a process, right? So start <laughs> by documenting it so you can evaluate it and improve upon it. But mm -hmm. what I had to do was stop reinventing the wheel, stop making every deal a new adventure and get a little bit more systematic about it. And then as far as who do I hire first, mm -hmm. you know, my answer to that is always this. It really depends. And I'm not going to just leave you with depends because I despise when people answer questions that way. But look at what you're doing in the business that you either hate or you are bad at. Objectively, not the best. Yeah. And, and that's where you start. So for every, it could be different for everybody. I'm not a gifted salesperson. So I knew early on I needed a really good, good, legitimate salesperson to help me go to the next level. It wasn't going to be me. I was competent and I was only competent because it was my company. If right. you hired me as a salesperson, you will be really sorry because I'm not good <laughs> at it. So I had to do that. I also know when I, I've taken many personality tests, all I've taken them all. And without 
fail, every one of them tells me in bold block letters, you have no attention to detail whatsoever. So for me in my business, the, well, the actual very first hire I ever made was for what I call a transaction coordinator, mm -hmm. which in the wholesaling world is someone who takes all the contracts from the sellers and the buyers, they send them to the title company, and then they interface with the title company on all the details that have to get done mm -hmm. to get that property to the closing table and ultimately closed. And I'm bad at it. I'm, I hated it. And I hated it and I was bad at it. So it's like a double whammy. I knew I needed that person in my company and I hired her and she was great. She was the first person I hired. Uh, the big mistake I made there was I burnt her right out. Like she, I gave her everything that I was doing and just handed it over and said, I did it so it can be done. Obviously mm -hmm. you can do it. And at one point, you know, she, things were falling through the cracks and I finally had to um, confront her about it. And I said, listen, what's happening? Like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? What happened here? And she said, I literally fall asleep on my keyboard every single night. When I wake up, I start working and I go to sleep and I wake up at some point in the middle of the night with my head on my keyboard. Mm -hmm. I can't keep up with what you're asking me to yeah. do. And I had to take a good look at it and go, wow, I was asking her to do a lot of things, not just transaction yeah. coordination. There was a lot of things. And I had to pull some of that off her. And once I put her in a, in a, in a clear, um, well-defined lane, I call it like put her in her lane. Mm -hmm. She excelled. She was great. It, it just, I was asking to, I was asking her to, to act like an owner of a small company mm -hmm. when that's not what she was. And she wasn't being compensated like that either. To be fair, she was being paid to do a job and I was asking her to do three jobs. Yeah. I think we're often guilty of that because that's the way we are. We, we are the people that dive in and do whatever. And if you're kind of, I can't tell you how many nights I've been up at I won't even tell you what time doing stuff that I had no business doing. I should have, that should have been my first clue that I should be hiring it out, yeah. but we hang on to stuff and um, it's never going to be done exactly like you would do it. Like you said, very often it's going to be done better than you would do it because yep. it's not your, your, it's not what you like to do or you're not good at it. Yeah. But that is so, um, you're back again to treating people like people, yeah. which I think, to expect someone to work eight full hours for eight full hours pay, it just isn't going to happen. You have yeah. to get real about, and, and more about what is it you want them to accomplish. And maybe that's, I want every deal that I give you to go smoothly and all the details so that I make the money. I think we have to change our own mindset. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I absolutely would agree with that. And you know, I, it took me a while to get that. It just did. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I talk about it in the book too. Like, if you hire people and you expect them to care about the company as much as you do, you're going to consistently be sorry. And it's not, it's not a negative. I, I, they, they probably couldn't or shouldn't. Nobody can care about your baby like you, yeah. right? They may love it and they may feel passionate about it and they might really feel like they would do anything for it, but they can't quite have the same feeling as the person who created it and the person who it belongs to. So mm -hmm. when I stopped thinking that that was what I was trying to get them to do and realized that I, I just want them. So, you know, you mentioned culture and, and this is how, this is really how you retain people because I, in the book, I talk about it. Your business has a culture, even if it's you and one other person, even if it's just you, your business has a culture. Now, if you say, no, it doesn't because I didn't create it, uh, it has a crappy culture then probably, <laughs> you know, every business's culture is like its personality. You know, your business culture is, is your business personality and your business might have a bad personality. It's because it's not been put in check. It's not been cultured and cultivated. So it's important that you create an environment that makes people want to be there. I have worked for companies when I was working nine to five, I've worked for companies that I, I hated every, I hated walking in. I was miserable all day and I never wanted to come back. And I, I've I'm, honestly, I've worked for companies where, I got up and looked forward to go in because I, I enjoyed the people. I enjoyed the culture. We had a lot of fun. We got a lot of things done. And there were com there was one company in particular that I worked for that I was like, I'm going to retire here. I love this place. And, and I didn't end up doing that because the company went out of business. But the culture was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Everyone loved being there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's if you can create that. I always think that I use that company as sort of like this – uh, this is, this is the goal, right? If I can make people feel like I did when I worked there, the rest will take care of itself. I, I wasn't making, that's not where I made the most money, but it's where I was the happiest. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, that's a, that's a really great tip. Um, and you're right. If you if you haven't consciously created a culture, you still have one, and you you need to really take a look at where you are. I love that. But I love that you talk about masterminds and mentors and that they, I think they are truly the secret sauce for really fast growth and profitability. And um, yeah, one thing I, I, I want to circle back to this, it's not easy. It's not always easy to write that check, but invest no. in yourself because the, the rewards at the end of that are so much bigger and it's so much less painful getting right. to the, getting to the next step. Yep. So um, tell people again, I'm going to put this in the show notes, but the title of your book, which I actually really like. Thank you. I appreciate that. The title of the book is Level Jumping. Level Jumping. Okay. If you could give folks out there one piece of advice listening today, um, wherever they are, people right now are discouraged. Um, uh, a lot of people are discouraged. They, they are ready to throw in the towel. They feel they feel overwhelmed by real estate, you know, with its ups and downs and cycles and coronavirus and everything. Mm -hmm. What would you, what would your advice to these folks be? For people who want to start or people who already have a business? Both. both. Okay. So for people who want to start, uh, I would tell them uh, there is no perfect time to start your business. Uh, I, I started in 08. It was what the general public would tell you was the worst time for real estate in the history of the world. Turns out it was the best time for real estate investors. It was great for us. So there's no perfect time to start. Don't listen to the media. And for that matter, you know, I don't want to say don't listen to your friends and family, but you know, they're going to try to protect you. You know, they're going to try to protect you. They have nothing but your best interests in mind, but they don't know. Don't listen to anybody who doesn't have a business that you envy, you know, or that you aspire to because they, they just don't know. So start now, get started. Um, that's my number one advice for, for new people. Do some research, learn a little bit, learn just enough to get started and then get started and then learn a little more and then act on that. It's all about implementation and, and just going out and doing it. So that's what I would tell a new person. Someone who already has a business is, you know, I talked to someone a couple of weeks ago, someone from our seven figure flipping mastermind. He called me and said, I need to talk to you about my business during this whole, this was like, I think a month ago or maybe. And he's like, everything is changing because of the coronavirus. I, I can't do business the way I used to. Like the rules of the game have changed. And he's like, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can handle this much change. And I said, listen, whether it's a coronavirus or whatever, your business and in, in, in the environment that you're operating your businesses is going to change consistently. If you're not comfortable with that, if you're not willing to deal with change, yeah, this might not be, you might not be an entrepreneur. You might not want to do it, right? Yeah. Like there will always be change. And I, I, Lately, since the coronavirus is when I started kind of talking about this, and, but I really look at life and, and when it, as it relates to business or whatever it is, personal, it doesn't matter. It's like a chess game and you're, you're playing chess with life. It doesn't have to be adversarial, but the fact of the matter is life will change things for you. They'll add, here's the coronavirus. No one saw it coming, but it, it's a fact of the world now. So you can either say, I quit or turn the board over or say, I'm done. Or you can say, okay, that's, that's. That's life's move. That's, you know, it's it check. It's not checkmate because I didn't quit. It's check. So now I have to get myself out of this situation. I need to figure out what my move is going to be. How am I going to counteract what life is handing me to make sure that it works and I'm, I continue to move forward? And that's what entrepreneurialism is. It's just you're playing chess with life. And it doesn't mean that it's life's against you. It just means they're making moves and you have to, you have to adjust to it. And I think when you already have a business and you're going through time like the coronavirus, or maybe you have a divorce or something happened personally, you have to adapt to the situation and figure out what your move is going to be so that you can still thrive. It's, there's a book called, uh, I think it's called who moved my cheese or, and I'm I trying to think of it. Yeah. Right. It's like that, that is life. Mm -hmm. It will always change. You just have to change your approach. You have to move with the cheese. That's just the way it is. It's not good or bad. It's just a fact. It's a fact. And if you're in this business anytime at all, you'll know that real estate is very fluid. It changes. Mm -hmm. Interest rates are up. Interest rates are down. Deals are hard to find. Deals are easy to find. Yep. And that's what is the one thing that will, I think, determine your success is being able to pivot. And yeah. you will need to do that. Totally. And, and the good news is for everyone listening right now, real estate investing can work in any market, in any environment. It can work. It may not work the same as the way you're doing it now, 
but it will and can work. I know too many people that have been through all the market cycles and they're still here and they're still, they're still doing fine because they just adjust. They adjust with what's happening. So um, don't be discouraged by the coronavirus. Don't be discouraged by, you know, oh, it's a seller's market. It's a buyer's market. None of that. It's just, just look at the situation and make decisions and move forward. And, and honestly, uh, I think in life, when you're, when you think you've kind of reached the end of your rope or like, I, I, I this is just, I'm struggling. I, it's too much. I want to quit. Usually right on the other side of that is a breakthrough usually. Mm -hmm. So you just have to have that faith in yourself. So that's, that's, yeah, what I would say. that's a, that's a great, that's a great, great point. Now I know that you've got an, an seven figure flipping, you all have got an event coming up in the fall. Uh, you want to talk yep. about that a bit? Yeah, totally. It's called Flip Hacking Live. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in October. Um, it normally is in San Diego. This year we're holding it in Orlando. So we're excited about the change of venue. Uh, if you go to um, fliphackinglive.com, you can check it out, get all the dates and everything. It's mid-October. I can't remember the dates off the top of my head now, but it's mid-October. Um, it is, th it's two and a half, really three days. We say two and a half, but it usually doesn't get over until four o'clock on the third day. So it's three days of real estate investors getting up on stage and sharing what's working for them, sharing their strategies, their tips, everything that they know that they're experts at. And I can tell you the best thing about this event far and away is we don't, fly in these professional speakers from around the country to talk about real estate. What we bring up on people that we bring up on stage are people who are doing it right now. They're in the trenches, they're operators, they're, you know, the, the leaders of their companies and they're not professional speakers. It's not always super polished, you know, but the, the thing about sometimes the unpolished actual, you know, technician or the person who's in the trenches is a lot of times you get the polished people up there and they kind of give you just enough to get interested and then they send you somewhere to you know, spend more money. Nope. These guys are just, they don't have nothing to sell. They're just dumping information out and they don't know, you know, I say it kind of tongue in cheek. They don't know what not to share. They, they just share everything because they don't have that filter. So it's a really, really powerful couple of days where you get to, you get to listen to and hang out with for that matter, network with, some of the smartest real estate investors from around the country. And they're just, they're just giving it all out for free. They're just giving you their knowledge. Well, I'll be sure and put a link to that. And also be sure and check out Mike's podcast, Just Start Real Estate. It's a great podcast. Mike and I, we both started, I think we said both around 2013. Yep. So um, both when we were both clueless about anything to do with podcasting. <laughs> Another point, just, just jump in and do whatever it is. Just jump in and do it. I promise you it'll, it'll almost always turn out okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. We've been doing this a while now. We've been doing it for a little while. We've been doing this a while now. So what's the best way for folks to reach you? Uh, the best way for them to reach me is, well, the, the book Level Jumping is on Amazon. So you can go check that out. Uh, you can go to my website, mikesimmons.com. Or if you want to shoot me an email, you can go to mike at juststartrealestate.com. Okay. That, there you got a bunch of ways to get in touch with Mike. He's a very knowledgeable guy. He's been the little guy. He's, he's got a big business now, but he understands the inner workings between all the different levels. And, I'm, and I know that for sure. Well, Mike, thanks so much for coming on this show today. It was great catching up. We're not going to leave this for... Uh, let no. some years pass uh, for that. So thanks so much. <laughs> thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Uh, I, I do regret the years, but listen, we won't do it anymore. And it was awesome mm -hmm. catching back up with you. You're a cool person and uh, super knowledgeable yourself. And I just love hanging out with people like that. Well, it's, it's, it, it truly is great fun. And listen, to all the listeners that are listening in on the show, thank you so much. And if you like this show, please do me a huge favor and leave us a rating and a review over on iTunes. I really do appreciate that. And I will see you next time, uh, next week, same time, same place. Bye for now. All right.